Hey everyone, welcome to your section one vocab review. In this one, we're focusing on the first semester microeconomics. So we'll be covering modules one, three, and four. We'll skip module two, cover that later when we get into macroeconomics. Probably like to see this video again at that point. So let's go over the terms that you need to know for this week's vocab check. The first thing we're going to be covering is marginal analysis. We're going to get much, much deeper into marginal analysis in this class and in macro as well. The key thing to know about marginal is whenever you see marginal, don't think about borders or tiny amounts. Marginal means additional in this class or additional for one more unit. So we're talking about marginal analysis. We're talking about analysis of doing one more of something. And then should I do one more of something? or one more. This is something really, really powerful and very, very important into the field of economics. It's kind of going, should I study one more hour or another hour or another? At some point, your gains are going to diminish while your costs of doing more of that are going to increase. And we'll talk about where you kind of want to balance them out where the additional cost equals additional benefit that's a big rule that we're going to cover in economics. So the key to marginal analysis, it's essentially doing one more of something until the cost equals a benefit or the gains equals the loss or cost. Okay. Resource is a very simple term. It's anything that is used to produce a good or service. Now, when you ask, hey, what are the resources? The factors of production are essentially those things. The first factor of production we have is land. Don't think of land as just the ground. Well, it does include the ground. It's gifts of nature or natural resources. So when you start thinking about what are examples of land, it's anything that man isn't producing that we use to make goods and services. So it can be the ground a building lays on or a farm field, but it can also be things that we don't produce like crude oil or iron ore. These are things that we pulled out of the ground, but also forest, sunshine, wind, things we use to make good and services that we didn't make. The second one is labor. Labor includes all people, that's humans, doing, giving up their time, effort, and skills to produce goods and services. So if you think of a shoemaker, factory worker, plumber, teacher, all of that is included in labor. Machines do not count, so a robot, would fall under capital. So capital is one you guys have a hard time remembering as the year goes on, but it's a really, really simple thing. It's all man-made goods used to produce goods and services. So we make capital. It is a capital good we can produce, but those capital goods are also used to make other goods and services. What are examples of capital? Well, this lovely new line board here is capital. The computer I'm recording this is the building, bulldozers, dump trucks, all those things are examples of capital. They're man-made goods used to produce goods and services. Now be careful because a good or a consumer good would be like your computer at home. You use that for yourself, for your own benefit, where I use this computer to produce a good or service. A car, like a taxi, can be capital, but your car that you use for your own benefit is a consumer good. So just remember, a car could be any. It just depends on how we're using it. All right. The last, so when we cover the three factors of production, land, labor, and capital are the big three. They're the big three because we can produce or use more land, labor, and capital. If I'm a producer, I can buy more natural resources. I can hire more labor. I can employ more capital. But entrepreneurship is a fourth factor. It's a special one that... We won't talk about a whole lot because it's not very measurable, but it is still very important. Entrepreneurship is the lifeblood of our economy. Without entrepreneurs, we don't get that improvement. So what is an entrepreneur? It's someone who produces, I'm sorry, someone who runs or owns or creates a business. They're the risk takers. They're the ones who have an idea, think I can do something better, and then try to. A lot of times they fail. That's why it's a risk taker. When they fail, they lose. But if they do something better, people will go to them to get that good, that value, and they can be heavily rewarded. So without entrepreneurs, economies have a hard time growing and improving. 
So it's a very important thing that we want to foster. But if I'm a factory owner and I'm like, I want more of this good, I should hire 10 more entrepreneurs. Well, that's not how it works. So entrepreneurship is very important, but not necessarily something we'll measure and kind of use in our calculations. All right. We need to know what scarce or scarcity means. Remember, because wants are unlimited, we have scarcity. And scarcity means we don't have enough of something to meet all people's wants at no cost. So we said, hey, is air scarce? Well, no. Um, we can, I can get all the air I want. There's really no cost to it. But if we said things that are bigger, like food, um, clean water, those things can be scarce because people want it, but there's going to be a cost to it or not enough to meet all the wants. And if you think water, yeah, right now, summer Florida, it's raining all the time. But in California, those guys would sure like a lot more water, especially at no cost. Now, as we get into cost, we need to make sure we know what a trade-off and an opportunity cost. Remember, trade-offs, that concept means to make one thing decision, you have to not make others. General idea. It seems very similar to an opportunity cost, but it's not. Because what opportunity cost is, is it's something that it's the value of the foregone option, or in English, the value of the next best choice. Now, we'll probably cover this a lot deeper in class, but make sure you understand it's when I make one choice, I don't give up all the other choices. I'm only really giving up my next best option. So think if I have a choice and four other options, if I don't choose this, I didn't choose four different things. Instead, I gave this one up and I would only choose the next one because if I don't do this guy, well, I'm just doing this. I'm not doing these guys as well. So that's the idea. We talked about opportunity costs as a true cost of college. It's not how much you just pay, what we call explicit costs, like out of pocket. It's also implicit cost, like an opportunity cost of foregone wages that I would have gotten when I was working. So that's a big thing to kind of think of with opportunity cost. It's if I chose the other option, oh, I'm sorry, if I choose this option, what am I giving up as in my next best option? So that's your opportunity cost. Okay. Economic growth is an important one, but first we need to get into what is a production possibilities curve. So what is a production possibilities curve? Well, it's this thing. Okay. I have consumer goods and capital goods, and those are just random things that I picked that are kind of related to this. I could use apples and baseball bats. I could use smartphones and eggs. The goods not relating is just fine. They can relate, but then we kind of got to get deeper into our graph. And we're going to cover more about these in class. But until then, what we're going to do is cover these guys like so. So let's say we are an economy and we only produce two things. We produce capital goods and consumer goods. Again, it could be apples, baseball bats, just two things. Well, here's the thing. We're going to show how a production possibilities curve covers lots of economic concepts. That's why you're going to see it several times, especially later on on exams and apexes and all that stuff. So what it means is this. If I want to make more capital goods, I'm going to have to employ more land, labor, capital, more resource into making capital goods, which means I will get less consumer goods. So if I'm producing at point Y right here, and I want more capital goods, I can go to point X. So you notice I'll go up this graph. So if this was, if this was 10 capital goods and this is 13 capital goods, well, I got more. But on the other hand, I started with 20 consumer goods. Well, as I move more resources to make more capital goods, I'm moving them away from producing consumer goods. It's kind of part of an opportunity cost. And then I could say, all right, I got, let's make this 14 consumer goods. So we can show things like opportunity costs to move from good Y to good X to get three more capital goods. It cost me six consumer goods. So what this shows 
uh, in a much more general sense here is the relationship between those items. Now, there's some general assumptions to make sure you have with a production possibilities frontier that we're going to get deeper into. But one is this. What it represents as a production possibilities frontier or curve, same thing, is a frontier is a limit. It, it's the edge of what we can do. So if we're on the frontier, that means we are efficient. What does that mean efficient? It means we're employing all our resources to the maximum effect. So nothing's sitting there, no workers are twiddling their thumbs, no machines and capitals not being used, no land is just sitting out in a field to rot. We're employing all our resources best we can. So anything on the curve like X, Y, and Z, those are all perfectly efficient. On the other hand, point A is inside the curve, which means at point A, we will get less capital goods and consumer goods than we would at point X, which means if we're at point A, we are inefficient. We're under producing and we can't produce more at no, no cost. So think if I went from A to X, I get more capital goods and more consumer goods. And what did I have to give up? Nothing. So this is what we call inefficient, where X, Y, and Z, anything on the curve is efficient. You might say, Z, no, you get no capital goods. It's inefficient. Actually, it is because it's on the curve. Let's say we're just in a function right now of all we want is consumer goods. Well, then Z is fine. And that's something that we'll call normative analysis. But positive analysis, positive analysis is like measurable. That would be perfectly efficient on the curve. And lastly, we have point B there. And point B, what that one does is that's outside of the curve. Now, there are a few ways to visualize this. Anything outside the curve is considered impossible. Because if we are at our production possibilities curve, what is possible is what's on the curve or inside it. Inside it's efficient, on it is efficient, outside it is impossible. Can't be done. But just to complicate things. What if somehow we did get to point B? What that would mean is we had to change something. We had to have more resources, land, labor, capital, human capital, which is that thing that improves labor. Check your book for that one. So human capital is when you get educated, more skilled experience and labor becomes more productive. It's a pretty cool thing. But what we have there at point B is if we added human capital, so I educated all my workers, or they're more skilled, or they're more experienced, then they'd be more productive. And this curve would actually start to grow outward. And we would have something called economic growth. So B is impossible unless you add more land, labor, capital, human capital, or technology, and that would allow you to go out to point B. But remember, it's impossible if nothing changes. A little trick there. Oh, and lastly, just to make sure you guys all understand, a PPF can also be a straight line. We'll talk about that, which means you have constant um, opportunity cost, or it's a ratio, but bowed out means you have specialization. Things we'll get more into later. Okay, so, if we go ahead and take this graph, we can go ahead and minimize it and check it away. We have economic growth. We just covered that. Line going out. Production possibilities curve. Efficient. Bunch of things. And just before I get into, shall we say, the, the hard part, the comparative and absolute advantage, I want to cover ceteris paribus. Ceteris paribus is a Latin phrase essentially meaning all else equal, or all things remaining unchanged. This is going to be an important concept, and you're going to hear me say it a lot to you guys as the class goes on. The reason is, when we're talking about this in basic economics, we try to change one variable at a time. We're going, all right, what if we change this variable, what happens? And then I go, what if we change another variable, what happens? What if we change this variable? So if I start and go, here's the situation, and I change one variable, what we'll always assume is that there's ceteris, ceteris paribus applies. So if we change one variable, all the other ones are not changing. 
The reason is this simplifies everything. So if we start talking about, okay, if all of a sudden more workers are added to the economy, what would happen to labor? You'd say labor would increase. You're like, but some kid might be like, but what if they're all old sick retirees? Workers aren't increasing that. You're right. And what if another country is invading and they lose population and now all of a sudden uh, they're not able to produce and buy stuff from us? Hey, man, you make a fair point. But instead of making that, but what if this other random thing outside of our scope is happening? We're just going to say setters paribus. So when I say more workers enter the economy, the only thing you need to know is that one thing's changing and setters paribus means everything else isn't. So I say, hey, if it's a very hot day in the summer, will you sell more or less ice cream? No, oh, hot day in the summer, more ice cream. And if someone goes, yeah, but if it's raining, people don't get it. Yep, setters paribus. It's not raining. It's the same as day one, cold day, day two, hot day. We don't care about any other factors. Everything else, constant. Okay, now let's go ahead and make sure we understand gains from trade, some specialization. Remember, specialization, the key to that one is if you have specialization, the PPF will bow outward. If you have no specialization, straight line on the PBF, PPF. So this PPF right here, which somehow isn't cut, there we go. Uh, this PPF has two economies. We have country one, which is purple, and we have country two, which is it's red. And they produce only two goods, guns and butter. Maybe an American history reference right there. So we're making guns and butter. And country two, if they put all their resources into play and are efficient, they can produce 100 units of butter, or they can produce four guns or anything in between. Now it's a straight line, so we'll assume that all resources are equally usable um, in production in both goods. It should be a curved line, but in this one, we're making an assumption. If we make that assumption, it means we have straight lines, and straight lines means easy math. That's why. Okay, but country one here makes 21 units of butter and 14 guns. So what it means is this, if they're both producing those goods, we can look at what is an absolute advantage. An absolute advantage simply goes to the country that makes the most of a good. Now, this is really simple because you go, okay, so country two made a hundred butters or country one made 21. So who has the absolute advantage in butter? Well, country two. And I said, who has the absolute advantage in guns? Well, Country one made 14, country two made four. So obviously country one is the absolute advantage in guns. That's how easy absolute advantage questions are. Now we might say, what would happen if they traded? Well, in this, we're gonna get deeper into this math is for every one gun country two makes, remember they made four, they give up 25 butters. So that's a 20. That's not right. That is a 25 to one ratio of guns to butter. So the cost of one gun is 25 butters for country two, woof. But in this one, we have country one and we might say, hey, they made 14 guns and 21 butters. That means it only cost country one 1.5 butters for every gun. So who makes a cheaper gun? Well, if I have to give up 25 butters for every gun, that's an expensive gun. But if I only have to give up one and a half butters, that would be a cheaper gun. Now, if they decided to trade, they could trade at a ratio of 10 to one. So that means for every gun that country one makes, they would get 10 butters from country two. And if they were able to do that, so let's say they went ahead and gave up five of their guns. So they gave up five of their guns. I'll make a kind of five of their guns. <clears throat> country one would only have nine guns left. Let's say this is five. But country two would have five guns. 
And if you get five guns, they would still have 50, but I'm sorry, country two would have 50 butters left because they gave up 50 here, which means they'd be consuming at this point where country two gave up 50 butters. So they got 50 left, but they gained five guns. Remember, they could only make four by themselves and now they have five and they're producing outside of their production possibilities curve. On the Uggs of those country twos, though. On the other hand, country one got 50 units of butter, and they have nine guns, which means country one is way outside their production possibilities frontier. This is why we call gains from trade. When countries trade with each other, both are better off. You might say, I don't know about that, but here's the thing. If countries are rational and they're trading with each other and have perfect information, They'd only make a trade if it made them better off. They would never make a trade going like, oh, no, I want to lose. No, they'd always make trades that make them better off. So trade is good. Trade makes both better off. And if two countries have a trade that would make them worse off, they would simply not do it. So we'll talk about trade more later. But that's how gains from trade work in this whole scenario. Now, let me get rid of some of this stuff. Now you see absolute advantage, and what's really easy is if both countries have a different absolute advantage, they also have the same comparative advantage. So what this means is if I go ahead, but yeah, okay, there we go. Shrink that guy, maybe. Um, if I go ahead and bring out these two countries right here, I have country A and country B. And if they're producing guns and butter, you might notice that country A makes 70 butters, while country B has 42. Country A makes 10 guns, while country B makes eight. So I said, hey, who has the absolute advantage? Well, the answer to that is kind of tricky because the answer is country A has the absolute advantage in both. Ooh, that's tricky. However, comparative advantage is what really determines whether countries will trade with each other. Now, a lot, some of you guys might right off the bat and say, hey, country has the absolute advantage of both. They should just make both and they'll be better off. But that actually isn't true, and math will show that. What it means is this. Country A should do what their but comparative advantage means. Each country should do what they're best at compared to what the other country is best at. Essentially, it means each country should produce what they make at the lowest cost. This is going to be kind of the, that fundamental uh, concept we have here. So country A makes uh, guns. So one gun, if you go 10 to 70, equals seven butters. And if we flip that over, it's one-seventh of a butter, and they allow this kind of math now, but that's about think 0.16-ish guns equals one butter. So remember, this is cost of. And if we go ahead and look at country B, how are they doing? Well, they make it at a rate of one gun equals six butters. And one butter, go one to six, that Oh, that is way up. Oh, actually, I think that's more like 15. Um, I think it's going to be a lot closer to 0.18. Now, these are actually pretty similar, but you'll notice that one country, that one country is producing um, at a lower cost of guns and the other is producing at a lower cost of butter. So each one should do what they produce the least at, which is country B should produce guns and country A should produce butter. So that's the short of it. That is how comparative advantage works. The key there for comparative advantage right now is know the definition. This would be a lot longer if I went into the depths of it. That's kind of the hardest of the easy stuff. But make sure you study comparative advantage and know its definition. Comparative advantage always goes to the country that produces a good at the lowest cost 
compare to the other country. Or in the short, whoever is best, best at producing that good should produce that good and the other country should produce the other. We'll talk about kind of little cheats you can do on this. So I hope this video helped and I look forward to seeing you all on Monday.